Well, it's out. Over the winter break, I sat down to watch the newly released Dragons the Nine Realms, and it's not a complete disaster. The Nine Realms follows the story of Tuomas Kullarsen, more commonly known as Tom, as he follows his mother Olivia to her job at a research station built above a newly opened chasm in the earth and consequently discovers dragons are real and has to hide this fact from his mother. My feelings about this series are very conflicted, because there are some things I actually really enjoy here, but then there are others that just cheapen the whole experience so badly. Let's start with the animation. It's stiff and awkward, which could be forgivable, because it's a TV series, if it weren't for the flying. If there is one thing a How to Train Your Dragon property absolutely cannot afford not to nail, it is the flying, and the flying in this series feels like I'm watching someone try to swim through molasses. It is so slow and awkward to watch. As for the dragons themselves, I can't say I'm really a fan of the majority of the designs here. Thunder's silhouette is still exactly as clunky and unwieldy as it looked in the first teaser trailer. His legs look like they're the wrong shape for his body. In the little end-of-episode sketches, I can see a version of him that looks much better, actually, but for whatever reason, that apparently didn't translate onto screen. Wu and Wei, meanwhile, are... yeesh. I can see what they were going for, sure, but this design doesn't look cohesive, and giving a two-headed dragon a single rider is just a recipe for disaster from a design balance perspective. I would have vastly preferred it if they went harder on the Chinese inspiration behind this design, actually. Give me one long, snake-like Chinese dragon. And they could have even added wings if they had to. But I do really appreciate that it is a water dragon, hearkening back to the fact that traditionally Chinese dragons are associated with water more than fire. Plowhorn is... According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way that a bee should be able to fly. Sorry, sorry I had to. I know she's a beetle and not a bee, but that's the only thing I could think the first time I saw a gembreaker fly. And honestly, I love the beetle wings. Really, she's fine, as dragon designs go. She does look really top-heavy with the sheer size of the horn, but I'll let it slide. The only dragon design I truly like in this show is feathers, and honestly, at this point, that's not even because she's amazingly designed or anything, she's just not horrible. <laughs> Again, like Wu and Wei, I think they could have gone a lot harder on the Mesoamerican design inspiration here. Give her a full mane of feathers, and much brighter colors, and make her an actual serpent instead of insisting on adding legs. But at least she is somewhat serpentine in general silhouette, as opposed to the zippleback knockoff. Oh my god, I just realized the Chinese dragon is a cheap knockoff of a beloved character. I don't know if that was on purpose, but if it was, I think someone might need to be fired. <laughs> and last but not least, there's the Fault Ripper, who, while looking cool, also looks like the most generic fantasy dragon I've ever seen in my life. You could take this design and place it in nearly any other fantasy series, and it would not look out of place, which is a pity, because How to Train Your Dragon have always been really good with dragon designs that feel like they came out of How to Train Your Dragon. And while I may not like all of the other designs I've seen in this show, at least I can tell what series they're from at a glance. Now onto the characters themselves. Firstly, my previous worry about diversity in the cast. Apparently, the creators heard people talking about how incredibly white the movies were, so this time around we have only one white character on our main crew. 
The gender divide is also perfectly even with two guys and two girls. We have Tom, June, D'Angelo, and Alex. Tom and June have been friends since they were children, but apparently they haven't seen each other since they were, like, six years old. June is the daughter of the project manager, I think, and Tom's mother is a renowned scientist who in fact predicted that this fissure would open when the comet that cracked open the hidden world hit. D'Angelo is the son of the head of security and the station's doctor, and I'm not entirely sure what exactly Alex's moms do, but they're also here providing some sorely needed queer representation. <laughs> D'Angelo's mother is a wheelchair user, and while it's not explicitly stated, June's mother might have some type of dwarfism. Either way, we're still getting disability representation, just not quite as prominently. These kids have followed their parents here because they work here. They've had their lives uprooted and are now a classroom of four because they still need their education even if they're living in an utterly wild location. And of course, because this is a show in the DreamWorks Dragons Extended Universe, each of them has to get their own dragon. Starting with Tom, and yes, I'm going to keep calling him Tom and spelling his full name without the H you English speakers like to put in it, despite the fact that neither he nor his mother can pronounce their own names. Though I'm not surprised, really this is what you come to expect when you speak any other language than English and then an American show decides to make a character that's even semi-adjacent to your background. I don't know how they did on the pronunciation of other names that aren't purely American, because my realm of expertise is not there, but quite possible they fucked up elsewhere too. Anyway, as I expected, it is impossible for me to actively dislike a character voiced by Jeremy Shada, but at the same time... Tom really is the least interesting member of the main cast, which is unfortunate because he's supposed to be the main character. <laughs> Similarly, his bond with Thunder the Nightlight feels the least earned out of any of the bonds between the kids and their dragons. He's curious about the fissure, so he goes down one night to explore, finds Thunder, and rescues him from under a pile of rubble. Then, later, he feeds him bits of fish bites, and the show does a very forced callback to the fish-eating scene in How to Train Your Dragon 1. And now they're suddenly bonded for life. I'm sorry, what? Then, later in this introductory two-parter, we have a scene that directly calls back to Toothless saving Hiccup at the end of the first movie, and I am sorry, but this one actually offended me. Sure, the previous callbacks felt forced and earned nothing but sighs and eye rolls, but this one? No, no, absolutely not. You have not earned this. Thunder and Tom do not even have a believable bond yet, never mind the level of bond that Toothless and Hiccup had. Absolutely disgraceful, cheap garbage. It really feels like with these two in particular, the show expects us to just accept that obviously they're bonded because they're each the descendants of Hiccup and Toothless, respectively. Which is not how character writing works. It's lazy and disappointing, and if I hadn't committed to reviewing this show, I probably wouldn't have bothered to continue, because this is really not a good first impression. <laughs> and then, later on, we find out that Thunder is looking for other dragons like him, which is just another dose of frustration because we have seen this plot before, and I desperately hope he just got separated from his family when the meteor struck and opened up the fissure, because otherwise I am going to have to flip a table. But moving on to June. She is the astrology bitch who has everyone's birth chart memorized, and I love that for her. She's also into tarot, and all things mystical and magical, but also protests whenever someone calls it magic. I do wish that they could just let her have dark eyes, though. I do believe that, at this point, it is a well-documented phenomenon for the Asian girl in a character group to have some quirky character design trait, though it's usually a bright stripe of color in her hair, so at least they didn't do that. 
Obviously, I'm not Chinese, so I can't speak on this, but I am curious about what actual Chinese people think about her being into all of this Western mystical stuff, like Western astrology and tarot cards, or about her being into all of this mystical stuff to begin with. I feel like it was a positive thing that she could only properly bond with Wu Wenwei once she let go of the Western fantasy tropes and fell back on the stories her grandmother used to tell her. But again, I am not Chinese, so I don't actually know if that's the case or not. <laughs> Given that she and Tom are the only characters out of our main crew who knew each other before the show started, they're the only ones whose bond we can just infer and don't have to build on screen. And the show does gain a lot from that. I honestly think if Tom had to forge bonds with everyone around him, this show would probably have fallen flat on its face, because it is not good at that. D'Angelo is the only character that I don't think I ever truly felt like his bonds weren't being built right. He's shown trying to bond with Alex, and feeling frozen out because June and Tom already know each other. He's not afraid to discuss his anxieties with his mother, and accepts affection from her with no false bravado. When June and Tom tell him about an injured lizard, he jumps at the chance to help because his grandfather's a veterinarian and has taught him some stuff. He bonds with Plowhorn through empathy and understanding, and honestly, the episode where he joins Dragon Club feels like the moment the show actually found its feet somewhat. It's obvious he has some issues around his dad being the chief of security and what that means for him in regards to forming friendships with the other kids, he also is apparently completely incapable of lying to his parents. In short, he's a good kid and I love him. And last but certainly not least is Alex. She's the last to join Dragon Club, but she's been around in the background helping Tom almost since day one. She is also autistic and has anxiety and is at least somewhat agoraphobic. Or, you know, she's written that way. I doubt they'll actually say any of these words because they never do. But hey, I'll take what I can get. She won't speak up unless a topic interests her, and interprets questions like Tom's startled where did you come from, not as rhetorical expressions of surprise, but literally and so literally tells him where she's from. I was born in Tuscaloosa. She is also shown being unable to consistently regulate the tone of her voice, having to specify she's being sincere because she may have sounded sarcastic. Seriously, I'm not being sarcastic, even though it sounds like I am. She hides behind and finds comfort in screens, and honestly, I have never felt so seen by a character in my life. It is almost unnerving. She's also a genius hacker who got Tom the maps he needed, and made him a way to get past the security system, which felt kind of a little rushed. At least the security system hacking did, because at that point in the show, I did not feel like they were close enough for her to stick her neck out for him like that. But it is what it is. Feathers took one look at her and decided to be an emotional support dragon, and I love that for them. <laughs> but in seriousness, I can see how some might see their bond as unearned, but to me it feels very natural. Feathers is obviously very inquisitive, and she's seen the other kids with their dragons, so when she found a child with no dragon, she investigated, and in doing so, unintentionally gave Alex the opportunity to work through some of her own past trauma in regards to the outside world and animals. I think it's sweet. It also gives Dom an opportunity to show that he's a genuinely kind and emotionally intelligent young man, and we do sincerely appreciate that in this house. But in the end, we kind of end up with this odd situation where the main character's bond with his dragon feels less earned than literally every other dragon rider pair in the series. <laughs> Which is funny because in How to Train Your Dragon, the entire movie is just Hiccup and Toothless earning their bond, and then the rest of the crew jump on the nearest dragon available for the climax, and then those pairs just stick with each other. But it also makes the rest of the show feel very odd, because by the end, you do end up feeling like, yeah, these people are friends. I can believe that. But all of these friendships are built on one bond that was never really earned, which isn't a massive problem once you get past the initial bumps. 
but it still leaves a weird aftertaste in my mouth. And on the topic of the season finale, there is exactly one callback I feel they earned, which is this one at the very end. Ow! That's for scaring me to death. But what about everything else? Like, sure, it's cheesy. But at this point, the characters feel like a cohesive unit enough that I can let y'all have this one. As for the plot, here I actually was pleasantly surprised. Mostly. I didn't realize we'd be spending our entire time on the research station, and never get to see what Burke turned into over the past 3,000 years, but that's fine. What I was really worried about was the usual scientist's bad plotline that stories like this so often end up spouting. Instead, what I got was, scientists are good, it is the corporations who demand that science be profitable who are bad. I did not go into this expecting any kind of anti-capitalist message, but I'll be damned if I ever complain about that. It's nothing mind-blowing, and there is this last-second introduction of a new possible villain that I don't really know how to feel about, but I wouldn't call it a garbage fire either. And the ending hook for the next season, where Tom notices that the pattern of Thunder's scorch mark matches the symbol on the family heirloom helmet, that actually sent chills down my spine. Granted, it's a moment that only really works if you've already seen at least the movies, but that's this series in a nutshell, isn't it? All in all, this is very much a setup season. We've gathered our players, the pieces are set, now the story can truly begin. But it's not just that either, it does have a conflict that runs through the season and gets resolved by the end, so on the whole, I'm not mad at it. Thanks for watching this video, if you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing, I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye!